WNST, Towson, Baltimore. And Baltimore Positive, the Crab Cake Tour has rolled on into week three. Uh, we're about to head back to the Eastern Shore and do some more things as well as some local places. And we still have some wild card dates up next week, uh, including uh, a couple of days at a Deep Creek Lake, Frederick County. I am having a crab cake in every county in the state of Maryland this month. 30 crab cakes, 30 days, and our 30th anniversary Luke, I'm so old. I went on the radio before the Ravens were even a thing. And look at how many years they've been a thing. Luke Jones was uh, down at the Crab Cake on Saturday night uh, when I was in St. Michael's eating a hideous crab cake with some great company. Uh, and uh, he will join us now with a fake football report. Just our favorite thing here to do in August. You can follow him at Baltimore Luke, as well as all of his thoughts, usually 12 of them because they come in dozens. I, I think you should add some land yap and add a 13th. I mean, I, I survived a Friday to 13th over the weekend, Luke, and the, the Ravens, for the most part, survived a Saturday the 14th against the New Orleans Saints. Yeah, I, I think we, we always make fun of it. You know I'm not a big preseason fan, as you alluded to, fake football, but I do like it because it's a checkpoint. You know, we've, we've had two plus weeks of training camp now where We've seen certain young guys look good, other young guys not look so good. Questions about the offensive line, questions about wide receiver, Lamar Jackson not being out there, then coming back and not having his full assortment of wide receivers, not having his full offensive line, and what that would mean for him and his status Saturday night, which I never expected him to play. I, I think it would have been bordering on organizational malpractice to put him out there. Uh, you saw the offensive line. Uh, we all saw uh, an offensive line that was very much undermanned and patchwork and cycling guys in. And I out. saw sieves at the Jimmy Buffett concert Thursday night that were yeah. better than that in the parking lot at the tailgate. Yeah. It, yeah so. I mean, this is a work in progress and, and, and to judge it as anything to say the roof's on fire or to say, you know, they'll be fine. I don't know. I don't somewhere in between. Right. Sure, sure. And I think what we've what we saw on Saturday night, which is kind of what we've seen over the course of this very strange, more strange than stupendous, as I describe it, this 18 game preseason winning streak they have going on, which, mind you, I, I, I have to throw this out there. I put this on Twitter. The last time the Ravens lost a preseason game, it was early September of 2015. So let's think back. Chris Davis was winding down a 47 home run season that would compel Peter Angelos to give him a $161 million contract. Also, and on a brighter note, <laughs> because as, as we talk about Chris Davis finally announcing his Lamar retirement. Lamar Jackson was in preschool, I think. Lamar Jackson, not, not quite. Lamar Jackson. So this was funny. The Ravens lost at the Georgia Dome against the Atlanta Falcons. Two days later, Lamar Jackson made his collegiate debut for Louisville against Auburn at the Georgia Dome, a neutral site game. So Lamar, as a freshman quarterback, played in the same building two days later, his first collegiate game after the Ravens last lost the preseason game. Now, there's no meaning to that whatsoever. I just found it interesting because I'm, I'm a nerd and I like stats and factoids and things of that nature. But what we've kind of seen over the duration of this 18-game preseason winning streak, kind of it manifested itself in what we saw Saturday night. I think if you look at those games, We've seen a transition from an offense, you know, from Joe Flacco and the end of the Joe Flacco era to now Lamar Jackson. But what we've seen on the defensive side of the ball is what's really held up here. And it's not just that the Ravens have a good defense, but more specifically, as it pertains to fake football, as it pertains to the second, third, fourth quarter of these preseason games, they have had exceptional defensive depth. And I think that's what we saw on Saturday night, a performance offensively that other than Tyler Huntley running around in the second half, not much to write home about at all uh, offensively. I mean, I, I think it was so difficult to judge anyone. Yeah, Huntley made more plays than Trace McSorley. Uh, their offensive line didn't block. They, they didn't run the ball particularly effectively other than Nate McCrary busting a couple. Um, McSorley had a scramble, but by and large, it was the defense and forcing six turnovers. Now, New Orleans, a couple of those were unforced, I'd say. But you get six, six takeaways, and you see what the Ravens did defensively from early on, where they had some starters in there for a while. But then getting into some of these young guys that we've been talking about and the high level at which they played throughout the course of that game, you know, save for a couple drives. You know, you gave up a couple runs, a couple passes, but uh, by and large, played really good football. 
that's been the theme of them winning all these games this last four or five years. I don't think, you know, is it that relevant to the big picture? Well, they've won one playoff game over the course of this preseason winning streak. But what I think it does tell you is how good the organization has been in finding defensive depth. Even if you're not talking elite, all pro player, all pro, all, all pro starters, they've found really good backups and even their camp fodder, right? Camp bodies, guys that are here for the preseason and then they're never heard from again. I would even challenge and say those guys by and large have been much better than the teams that they've gone up against. And that's kind of what we saw on Saturday night. To your point, are, are there any major takeaways? I'd say all their offensive line depth isn't very good. And, you know, I mean, Ronnie Stanley not being out there, Kevin Zeitler not being out there, Ben Cleveland not being out there. Villanueva played a couple series. Brad Bozeman leaves it with an ankle. I mean, they don't the have problem. much problems with a practice game, right? Like everything yeah. you just said, if <clears throat> I just came off a boat in St. Michael's, let's just say I'm a guy who ate 15 crab cakes in a row and wasn't paying so much attention to any of this nonsense. And you just said all of that. Stanley, Zeitler, Cleveland, Bozeman, injuries, no Lamar, no this, no that, no real running game, no passing attack to speak of that was in any way related to what we expect to see in Las Vegas in 29 days or whatever it is at this point, right? I've always been at a loss to judge these things because when I was young and, and the Colts played these games, I think there was some judgment. I think when the team came here 25 years ago, those first five or 10 years where there was that structure of what the first game represented, a quarter of real football, what the second game represented, maybe a quarter of real football, maybe a little bit more. The third game represented sometimes three quarters of football. And the fourth game was, was more of a throwaway and more of a job search. And that held for two decades. I don't know what this is anymore, and it has felt like such a cash grab from season ticket holders and whatnot. They put the game back now, but then there is what it is, and then what you tweet about other than having a sense of humor, because I'm assuming the third game is going to be total dog shit, right? I mean, I, I'm assuming the third game replaces the fourth, so – I don't know how to judge it. And we talked about this last week about it going into it. What do you evaluate and take out of it and say, oh, my God, the Ravens are in trouble? Because it certainly doesn't look fine. I mean, I'm not going to say it, that they're ready to play football because they're not. And and unlike Ozzy's line, like if we had to go lace up right now and go play, they had to go lace up and play right now. It might not go so well right right now. They, they better really use these next three weeks pretty pretty well. And I would think John, who never gets enough football, never gets enough players, never gets enough practice, never gets enough time, you know, I, I would think the next couple of weeks there's a little step of urgency because of all of this for all of the guys we've mentioned to say, oh, you're not ready now. You don't need to be ready against New Orleans and we can let these other guys take snaps and play. But like when the whistle blows in Las Vegas, we'd like to be sure what we're going to see. Not as fans, as the as the football evaluators. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. And to ask, you know, to answer your question as far as what are you getting out of it right now, you have to look at the individuals. You you look at certain, you know, a, a certain position group here or there. You know, I, I think you know we we haven't talked a whole lot about the defense. You know, I mean, obviously they added Justin Houston a couple weeks ago, so you'd like to think on paper their pass rushes. Not going to be the best in the league, but we know they're going to blitz. They're going to scheme pressure. They're, they're going to do the things that Wink Martindale has done over the last few years, and they've made it work against everyone not named the Kansas City Chiefs uh, in that way. But, you know, we've, we've talked about, okay, the, these young safeties, some safety depth behind Chuck Clark and Deshaun Elliott. You know, so we saw Brandon Stevens. We saw Geno Stone with two interceptions. Good for him. You know, a seventh-round pick last year who actually wound up at in Houston at the end of last season after the Ravens waved him. For whatever reason, he didn't stick there, and then he comes back to Baltimore, and the Ravens, you know, we'll, we'll see. He's got a chance to make the roster. Uh, Ardarius Washington, the one rookie free agent uh, of the bunch that I think has a chance to make the roster. Not saying he will, but so you're looking at those individuals. Uh, it, it was it was really fun to see Adafe Owe uh, look like Adalis Thomas back in the day and be the gunner on the punt team. You know, we saw that in the first quarter. I mean, that's 
that's that's fun. That, you know, that's something that's exciting to see. You know, uh, just a freakish athlete, a linebacker uh, as a punt gunner. I don't know so, you want him but, running down it, but okay, oh, I hear I, you. And I'm he not really saying he has as much value as everybody says he's going to. Oh, have. he's a but he's a rookie. I mean, he's not going to be. That's not going to be him five years from now. But you have Justin Houston, and you have Tyus Bowser, and you have Pernell McPhee. I mean, if if he can fill a role where he does that occasionally, I, I mean. I'm here for it because it'll be fun to fun to watch. Well, it's but, fun to watch. But it's even better if he's good at it, even better, right? So, well, and that's the and that's the point. Assuming he's good at it, right? Uh, I mean, Adalis Thomas, remember, was a Pro Bowl special teams player, but came before he became a Pro Bowl outside linebacker and got a bunch of money from the Patriots. So, you know, but but you know, a, a lot of what we said, though, you 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 were exactly right. They're not ready because strictly because of the state of their offense right now from a health standpoint. I mean, Ronnie Stanley practice some last week he still was on a day on day off very limited work schedule i mean i i think that bodes well four weeks ahead of the opener for him to be ready for week one now ready to play or ready to be the pre-injury form of ronnie stanley that's a question you know alejandro villanueva played a little bit uh, on saturday night a couple series you know he, that transition from right tackle he's acknowledged that that's been a little bit of an adjustment i mean i i can Remember years ago, you and I uh, having a live show with Marshall Yonda the year that he had to switch from right guard to left guard. And he said, it's you know, think about tying your shoes and everything. Just if you're right handed, you suddenly are doing everything left handed. Uh, it, it's an adjustment. So and he's going to be 33 next month. I mean, all, Kevin all I Zeitler, can think about is driving in Australia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. There, there, that might be a, that might be one of the better analogies. You know, you're not used to driving on the other side of the road, you know, on the so, other side of the car. Right, exactly. So, <laughs> so, so you have, I mean, Ben Cleveland's been a little banged up. Bozeman had a little bit of an ankle injury on Saturday night. Harbaugh said it's you know very minor, but that doesn't mean he's not going to miss some time here. Uh, and this is where or as I, Bill Belichick said, uh, it, tell tell any of my injured guys that it's a minor. Exactly, injury. exactly. I, I did see that over the weekend, but <laughs> but but I, you think, know I'm reading a little football, Luke. I still have Twitter. Right, but but I do think there has to be. I don't think it's a grave concern because you, know, you do look at the early schedule. And I think, especially now with Bateman having groin surgery, I mean, the Ravens are saying he's going to be back sometime in September. We'll see. I, I, if, I, my, if I'm a betting man, and, I, and this is purely my opinion, and kind of seeing how groin surgeries timelines play out, uh, either past Ravens or elsewhere, I wouldn't be surprised if it's early October when we're seeing Rashad Bateman. But the point is, this offense isn't going to be hitting its full stride week one. I think that's obvious, but you'd really like your offensive line to be able to stack some practices, whether they play against Washington. You know, the, the projected starting five is out there in two weeks, and maybe that's where things change a little bit. I don't know if the third preseason game will just be treated like the fourth now. I don't know. Uh, I mean, Lamar Jackson didn't play on Saturday night. Does he get to play uh, against Carolina and play a little bit against Washington? We'll see. I mean, I, I, I think... With it being three games as opposed to four, we are entering uh, uncharted waters as far as how coaches will approach it. But they do have the joint practices this week, uh, so that will be good, some good work. But with the offensive line, I do have some concern in terms of how quickly it comes together. I think on paper, you like what they did with bringing in Kevin Zeitler, but he hasn't practiced since the first padded practice when he had the sprained foot. Uh, so he hasn't logged that practice time in Villanueva. You know, has been was in and out of practice a little bit last week. He seems to be okay, but how's he adjusting the right tackle? How does Bradley Bozeman look at center when the bullets are flying for real, you know, in, in a live game setting? They've got to figure out left guard, whether it's Ben Cleveland, whether it's Ben Powers, whether it's uh, Tyree Phillips. You know, it's one of those three most likely. And as I mentioned, what does Ronnie Stanley look like? I would be surprised and then what if this, happens if he doesn't look right. Right. Exactly. Then so what happens. Well, and, and this is where we get into more specific things. This where it gets real slippery. Sure. Here, when well, you're trying is, to run the football in, in, in an orchestra, that is the most important underappreciated part of the symphony. No question about it. But this is where we do get into what ha what we saw on Saturday night and where I was concerned was not seeing enough functional depth. We know there was going to be drop off when Stanley and Zeitler are not out there, right? I mean, that, 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 that's expected, uh, even though New Orleans held out some of their guys uh, on their defense. But you're expecting some drop off. But when you're seeing Trace McSorley under duress as much, as frequently as he was, when you're seeing no running room whatsoever for J.K. Dobbins and Justice Hill, you, know, that you, you do look at that and say, well, okay. 
They have a very veteran right side of the offensive line. They have a left tackle coming off of major ankle surgeries, not one. He had more than, you know, he had two ankle surgeries. Uh, You have a complete unknown at left guard as far as who it's even going to be at this point in time. So you are looking for depth. You are looking to see what your depth looks like. And it didn't look very good on Saturday night. And that's what was concerning. And more specifically, I've, I've talked about Villanueva and that transition. We know Ronnie Stanley's injury history, even before the ankle. Who's the swing tackle on this football team? Because I can tell you what, Nestor, the number of guys that they tried there on Saturday night, it was ugly. Whether well, it was Patrick let's McCary, go back to, Phillips. to that position. The yeah. third tackle here over the last 20 years has, has been some. challenging. And, you know, it, from every Jared Gaither, through every Ja Reed, through every James Hurst, and every imported Andre Garad and Bryant McKinney, and you just go through the list of all of these people, this is always a problem. There's always been a John Ogden, and it's great until the pinky winky toe hurts. And then all of a sudden, who's Jared Gaither, and is he going to play, and can he play, and does he want to play? And, I, 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 you know, having that position and that the, the, I mean, might even mention Michael Orr for crying out loud, mm-hmm. right? Having that position and having that kind of player that's a $20 million player and whatever that drop off is going to look like from the, the number one starter to the number six starter, you, you, you know, when you take your, your ace out of the rotation, uh, you're going to. You're going to give up 16 runs on a Saturday night and maybe get your manager fired. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's and that's fair. But what I would say is when they have had, I, I think James Hurst is a great example here. And look, James Hurst in this town was very polarizing. I mean, he was the one who was thrown into Joe Flacco's knee and and, and kind of was the beginning, beginning the of the way, end for he Joe. He played a lot of football, didn't he? I mean, he did. really over the course of starting a little, filling in a little, injury a little, coming in in the third. He, he played a lot for being – a guy that they were always looking to do better than. Well, I I think outsiders were, I I think with James Hurst and he's serving that role. And we saw him playing for new Orleans on Saturday night. He's the guy he's kind of the perfect. I don't want to say perfect because he's not a great player by any means. So let's be very clear about this, but he is the guy that if your left tackle or your right tackle has a concussion and is out the next week. So, you know, we're talking about, a limited amount of time they're going to miss. You know, if they're missing half the season, a guy like him is exposed in a painful way. But if you're talking about one start here or there, which was kind of the case the first few years of Ronnie Stanley's career, you know, concussion, uh, had uh, an ankle at one point in time, uh, you know, that's some little things here and there. James Hurst can fill in for a week or two and you can get by. You know, uh, you're going to have to help them. You're going to have to have a tight end chip and things of that nature. But you want to have that. My point is, yes, you're right. Swing tackles don't grow on trees in this league. I mean, some teams, you know, a lot of teams struggle to find five starting caliber players, let alone trying to have a couple backups that you feel okay about at least. But when you just look at where the Ravens stand and, and this goes back to last year, they didn't have that swing tackle that you really uh, had any confidence in. Stanley goes down, Orlando Brown moves to the left side. Great. He played really well and he's in Kansas city and he's going to make a boatload of money now, but what did the right tackle situation look like? DJ Fluker wasn't, wasn't playing at a high level. Tyree Phillips wasn't playing at a high level. So, you know, that's where you do have a little concern. Ideally because of Stanley's situation right now, because Villanueva is going to be 33 and, and is playing right tackle for the first time, first meaningful extended time in his career, you'd like to have a little little bit of a higher functioning third tackle. I don't think that guy's on the roster. Uh, you know, it didn't look like Tyree Phillips. Uh, it didn't look like Ben Powers at, at right tackle. Didn't look like McCary. Didn't look like Michael Schofield or, or, or Andre Smith, two veteran guys they've brought in. So I don't know if they're going to just pick one of those guys and they're going to go with them or if they'll expect explore the possibility of adding someone we'll see uh but that's something that you look at and, and like i said it just comes down to the depth and what i think was a little well, if you dis- think you're gonna snot slobber knock and run the football this thing better start to you know i mean I, i'm not the sky is falling guy no but and, and talk and you know they, they better get this thing built and figure out what it is and to be very clear, I am not at all suggesting this is a sky is falling type scenario. I'm talking about, hey, if we're talking about maximizing their championship aspirations here, 
this is a really good football team, bar none. And to the point we we just discussed a few minutes ago, if they had to go out there and play a football game this week, they'd make it work and they'd beat most of the teams in the league, even even with kind of how patchwork they feel in, in a couple areas right now. But if you're trying to maximize where you are over the course of the season, now 17 games, and then, of course, January, where, where their legacy is, uh, I mean, it's all about January at this point. We know that. Uh, that That is something that I look to. And I think what was just a little disappointing for me uh, as it related to the offense on Saturday night, four of their five starters that, that started on, on Saturday night, now they were different positions. But those four guys started the playoff game against Buffalo. Now, we know how that game went, and, and the pass protection was poor, and they didn't run the ball quite as well as they normally do. And we know Lamar and the receipt, you know, the, it all fell apart. We know that. But understanding that, that's where I'm disappointed that you couldn't see a little bit better blocking from that offensive line, even acknowledging their two best linemen were out. But that's why, you know, with that being said, you know, to kind of transition now talking about the backup quarterback because Lamar didn't play. So we might as well talk about Trace McSorley and Tyler Huntley. That's why I keep looking at this battle and it's been very close during training camp. I would say McSorley is probably the more consistent performer on a day in and day out basis. But what we saw in the second half on Saturday night is why I feel Tyler Huntley is probably the right choice if you're only keeping one because he can imitate Lamar Jackson to a far greater degree than Trace McSorley can. We saw it takes off and he can improvise and uh, make something out of nothing, escape pressure. And he does have a strong arm. You know, it's certainly he's developing as a passer, uh, but you know, that if you're not going to have that ideal, perfect offensive line, and this kind of goes into Lamar Jackson makes everything better, right? He makes the running backs better. He makes the offensive line better. He makes the tight ends better. Uh, Even the wide receivers, you have defensive backs who have to peek in the backfield to make sure that Lamar is not taking off on their side of the field. And suddenly they need to come up and try to make tackles. So we know Lamar Jackson is the anchor. All of a sudden it becomes special teams. Right. So, but that's (laughs) where we, we do take a breath here and say, okay, yeah, there's some questions here about the offensive line. There's more upside, I think, this year than last year because they brought in Zeitler. You know, Villanueva, you hope, is at least not too far of a drop off from Orlando Brown. You know, I I think that's a reasonable, you know, kind of the 80 20 rule, right? You know, you kind of think of it in uh, simplistic terms in that way. Uh, But, you know, uh, Lamar is, he's the X factor here and he covers up for a lot of their weaknesses on offense. And we've seen it now for three years. And, you know, for as much as we talk about imperfections in his game or relative weakness in his game, Saturday was also a reminder as much as I just spent 10 minutes beating up the offensive line. It's also a reminder of just how special he is when you see Trace McSorley and Tyler Huntley, no disrespect to those guys. I mean, Trace McSorley was a sixth round pick and Tyler Huntley was an undrafted rookie free agent. So compared to a first round pick. So it just reminds you of Lamar drives the train here. And uh, the, the, as much as I just talked about some of the offensive line questions and, you know, I mean, we haven't even gotten into wide, wide receiver. I mean, we talked about Bateman, Marquise Brown should be back soon. He, he worked out and, and was running a good bit prior to Saturday's game, but it's all about Lamar. And when he's out there, all of these issues or questions or certain weaknesses here or there seem to go away. And frankly, even though it looks a little bit different in Baltimore than it does in Kansas city or green Bay or Tampa Bay right now, or, you know, pick your quarterback that you want to single out those, those franchise quarterbacks have a way of making those other things, not quite as serious for you make those other things not seem quite as bad. And maybe that's the biggest takeaway we, we kind of have, even though I completely agreed with the Ravens decision not to put them out there on Saturday because of the state of the offensive line. Luke Jones is here. I want to remind everybody Maryland restaurant week is back for its second year, kicking off September 17th. And uh, hopefully I will, have lost all of my uh, uh, Maryland crab cake tour weight by then. Uh, stop by participating restaurants. A lot of folks are going to be involved in this across the state. Uh, it is the second year, and you can learn more at Maryland Restaurant Week. Am I making you hungry yet, Luke? I mean, I, I, I'm much. trying to make everyone hungry. Um, <clears throat> I've had a couple of subpar crab cakes now on back-to-back weekends. I haven't mentioned it so much, the bad crab cakes. I'm trying to accentuate the great crab cakes. But uh, two more weeks of this ahead for the Ravens this week and practice and where they are. Pick me up some pieces, y- you know, for 
how you, I guess, crunch the second and third preseason games into this week, which is where we are in this clock in the middle of August to say, all right, injuries, getting guys ready. There is the next step of they're, they're back on the clock to play football again soon. 